This is Professor Resnick again. What I'd like to do is uh, present you a, uh, a summary um, of what we've done in the course. And um, I'm going to do that in terms of telling you a story about the uh, U.S. economy over the last, oh, let's say, four decades, roughly from the middle 1970s up until uh, the, the present. So I want to kind of review the course, exploitation, the business cycle, and so forth, contradictions, overdetermination, um, uh, through this story that I'm going to tell you about capitalism in the United States. Okay. Let me start out. We start out in the 1970s um, with a more or less uh, regulated capitalism. Um, I'm going to use the term uh, uh, that's popular now. wasn't That wasn't the term in the day. Um, in the 1970s, we still had, in many ways, the heritage of the 1930s in the United States, in which the state played a very important role in the economy. And what the state did um, was uh, intervene in a variety of different ways to maintain capitalism, to regulate it. Um, that was partly the lesson of the 1930s um, in which under F uh, FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the state intervened in order to try and get us out of that uh, business cycle. It didn't succeed. It took World War II to do that. But the st there were major changes which occurred um, at that moment in time um, that the state would play an active role in trying to offset um, the, the depression that was uh, occurring in the United States. And it was threatening uh, the survival of the United States. So secondly, the state played a very, very obviously key role in World War II. The third is, is that a new notion arose in the United States in which people looked more to the state, in part because of what it did in the 1930s, and in part because of this kind of collective um, action during the war, that the state had a role in providing, um, and let me again use a term popular today, a safety net for, for, for the society. And in so doing, the, the, the state would be kind of an employer of last resort, um, would regulate various key markets, including the labor market, and so forth. So the, the people understood, and people accepted and wanted the state to have this kind of uh, role in society. And Congress reflected that, um, and as did the various presidents, uh, both Republican and Democrat. In the 19, okay, so we got an economy in which um, the state is playing a major role. And by the way, it's also reflected in economics, um, Keynesian theory, um, which is a, a theory that explains the why the state should play this role. Keynesian theory was more or less hegemonic, and neoclassical economic theory had been demoted. So macro theory was, was a, a key um, uh, understanding um, in, in uh, economics uh, profession uh, around the land, and that's what was taught um, in most universities. It wasn't just as if micro theory wasn't taught, it was taught, um, but the macro theory and the Keynesian theory um, had a dominant place. The 1970s also starts, or the, excuse me, the 1970s is also characterized by the following problem, a major problem. And I'm going to put the problem on the blackboard. The surplus value in American industry was less than the demands on that surplus. So look what we've done here. We, we've gone right to the Marxian entry point where I began this course. And we're saying, OK, let's make sense of this problem in the United States from a Marxian perspective, which is that the surplus that was being pumped out of the workers was less than the demands on it. Basically, in non-Marxian terms, people understood the mid-1970s, late 1970s as, to be, as, to, as a severe crisis in American society. It looked as if American capitalism was nearing its, its end. Um, and people were worried, deeply worried, that our investments in plant and equipment and so forth was falling, our productivity was falling, where we, we weren't able to compete in a variety of different industries with our competitors, the Japanese, the Europeans, the Brazilians, and the Koreans, and so forth. There was a real problem. We were losing our edge in a variety of different industries in which we had a, 
uh, superior position after World War II, um, it was a problem. Okay? In Marxian terms, the problem is such. Okay? And I want to now look at the first the right-hand side and the left-hand side to explain exactly what this problem was in these value terms. So on the right-hand side, one, the subsumed class payment to workers via the workers' unions was very large. So maybe I should just add it over here. Helping this inequality on the right-hand side were these payments that the capitalists had to make to the workers. So what this was all about was that the price of labor power was greater than its unit value in industry after industry after industry. And you, you can ask, OK, why? Well, in many ways, this was the heritage of what happened in the 1930s, the presidency of Franklin Delano Roosevelt and the various presidents thereafter. It was, a, it was a period of time in which unions were, were looked upon favorably. They were strengthened under federal law. There was a culture which was supportive of unions. And all that helped the AFL and CIO in the United States to assume a strong bargaining position in a variety of leading industries, automobile industry, rubber industry, elect electric industry, and so forth, et cetera, transportation industry, in which those strong unions were able to get a price, a wage for their workers higher than the unit value. And that was supported by the federal government. Okay? So this is bad news for the capitalists. The bad news is this inequality. This is part of the crisis. Okay? The bad news, you had to pay these workers more than what they're worth in value terms. And that puts a strain on the surplus. But that wasn't the end of it. By the way, let me be consistent. That's bad news, okay, for the capitalists. Is there any good news? Yes, there is good news. The good news uh, from this uh, 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 extra payment to the workers because of the union power was that the workers had obviously higher wages, okay, via their unions, and so then the workers could take their higher wages and go out and buy all kinds of uh, consumer goods, which helped the capitalists realize their surplus. So the workers, monopoly position on the selling of labor power, earn them higher incomes. That's a disaster to the capitalists. That's the blackboard. But then the, the contradiction is there's a good side to the capitalists, which allows the capitalists to realize their surplus because now they can sell the cars and the boats and the homes and, and, and so forth to all the, the, the workers. So it, it's contra always contradictory. You know, for, for example, um, to, to drive this home. Um, the unions were very strong in certain uh, uh, cities in the Northeast that were producing, Pittsburgh, for example, uh, that were producing all kinds of, uh, you know, uh, uh, producing all kinds of steel um, in that particular uh, very famous uh, town. Okay. So the workers there had a higher, via the steel workers union, had a higher price of their labor power. That gave them higher incomes. That higher incomes, in turn, allowed those workers to have something which they hadn't had before, to buy a small house in the suburbs, buy a small house, to buy a car, to commute from the suburb to work and then back, to outfit the house with all kinds of consumer goods, including a little boat that you would put in the, uh, back in the uh, uh, driveway, which you would use on the weekends, and also to purchase something which became very valuable and reflected this which is tickets to the National Football League, which is a multi-billion dollar industry in the United States, which grew rapidly after you know, World War II. Okay. So the bad news is this, but then there's the good news for the workers and the capitalists. Okay. Next, there was another demand on the surplus, which was very large, which was in the form of corporate taxes. Okay, so the second one was the subsumed class payment that had to be paid by the capitalists to the federal government in the form of corporate taxes. Okay. 
So what that meant was that the capitalists had to take a significant share of their gross profits, the surplus, and pay them to the federal government. How high? If I remember correctly, I think the tax was 0.52. So more than half of the surplus had to be given in terms of a tax payment to the state. That was a disaster. Okay? So not only did you had strong unions, but you had a strong state putting demands on this surplus. So that's, that, that's bad news for the capitalists. Any good news? Yes, there too it's contradictory. Because it is true that the state took a hefty cut of the surplus, but then the state provided an environment in which the capitalists could produce and sell their goods, not just nationally, but, but globally. That is, if you think about what is the state providing the capitalists, well, the state is providing the capitalists, which is good news for the capitalists, is an enormous defense expenditures after the war to fight the Cold War. Okay? And so that means that the capitalists are producing and selling commodities to the state. It's kind of a guaranteed contract that the state is providing <coughs> by saying to the capitalists, look, you produce the tanks, the weapons, and you, the, the tanks, the airplanes, and so forth, etc. We buy, okay, and therefore, the capitalist has less risk than would otherwise because you're kind of a guaranteed market by selling to the state, and then the capitalist can produce these commodities and realize their sale to the state. So that's a great benefit to the capitalist. But of course, the capitalists are paying a tax on that. Number one, number two. The, the, US, the federal government, the U.S. government, provides a kind of, uh, oh, I don't know what to call it, kind of a protective network around the world, enabling the capitalists to sell their goods, not just in the states, but every place, because the United States becomes increasingly a hegemonic power after World War II. And so the defense expenditures are not just for a defensive army, but they're for bases around the world, which helps our exports around the world. Third. The state is providing all kinds of new research and development, which helps capitalists. You know, everything from uh, computers and chip, uh, computer chips and polio vaccine, jet airplanes, it's just, it's endless. The state is funding research and development in a variety of universities uh, around the United States and, and other places as well. And some, out of some of that research comes all these new products, which enable the capitalists to produce new use values embodying surplus value. So, to make a long story short, yeah, sure, there are costs, but there are benefits as, as well. Third, a new subsumed class payment emerges towards the end of the 1970s, which is OPEC. Okay. What happens now is that the oil, the oil producing uh, uh, state companies Organized, they get together, as I think I mentioned to you in Geneva, and they set a higher price for the barrel of oil. They allocate how many barrels their members will produce, but all of a sudden, that's a oil shock to America. Because now we have to pay higher prices for that on, on those important sea goods. And hence, that's another kind, you can think of it that way, as a kind of another tax. Besides the corporate taxes, there's a tax to OPEC. So a new subsumed class payment arises to OPEC, okay? And so you can see, in terms of the right-hand side, this is a kind of crisis. These, there's others, but I'm going to just focus on these. The workers via their unions, the corporate taxes via the state, the higher prices for energy via OPEC, okay? And the final one. On the left-hand side of the equation, we have a, 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 a problem, which I mentioned to you, is that American industrial capitalists are losing surplus value to their competitors. So this is a loss of surplus value 